Please welcome Jenny. Hello. Hi, thank you. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, how we use open data for collaboration and how um, open data brings new opportunities for collaboration uh, between uh, people who have data and people who can use data. Um, just a bit about me, I'm the technical director at the Open Data Institute. Um, and the Open Data Institute is an independent institute that was set up and started at the beginning of October last year. So we're almost a year old. Um, we've been seed funded with £10 million from TSB over five years. That's to get us up and going. And we have as part of, uh, of our remit that we need to attract funding to be self-funding within those five years, um, which we're doing from paying members, including Telefonica, um, from providing training and professional services, uh, also getting some philanthropic investment, for example, from uh, the Amidia network, um, and also engaging in research and, and getting research grants to do that. Um, so I'm the technical director there, which means that I'm in charge of the research aspect, the development that we work that we do, um, and also in charge of the kind of policy uh, generation, so uh, responding to lots and lots of consultations from government about what they should be doing with their open data. Our goals at the Open Data Institute are around unlocking supply, unlocking demand, and also communicating the value of open data. So. Um, around unlocking supply, our goal is to get more people to publish open data. We've had quite a lot of success over the past five or so years within government. They, they publish quite a lot of their, of their data now, um, is available as open data, although not the stuff that they get paid most for, which is the stuff that's most valuable, but they open up quite a lot of the other things. Um, so we try and help organizations to work out how to publish their open data. Uh, we help them on a technical level, so uh, what kind of formats they should use, um, at a legal level, so around licensing, um, but also in building business cases for opening data. Because you don't just open data for the fun of it, you should be opening data in order to achieve some organizational objectives you have. And building business cases enables you to justify the, the cost of opening up data. Um, we also help advise around engagement because uh, when you open up data, what you really want to do is have other people use it and, and do things with it. That should be core to your business case, otherwise there wouldn't be any point in opening it up in the first place. But often people neglect the actually going out and uh, engaging with and getting feedback from uh, the people who use their data. We also concentrate on unlocking demand for data. So we try and <coughs> Excuse me. We try and help organizations that want to use open data, which may be small organizations, new organizations, and maybe big organizations who can use open, use open data in their day-to-day -day, um, decision making. We have within ODI a startup program where we currently have um, 10 startups who are small organizations that are starting, whose, whose business is based on the availability of open data. Um, and it's really encouraging to see those organizations both consume and produce open data. We also run a bunch of challenges and hack days, usually over an extended period, so that we can actually ensure that the, the ideas that come, uh, come out with during those hack days actually develop into real products and real services that can benefit people. And that leads me on to the final thing that we try and do at ODI, which is communicate the value of open data. So it's not enough just to open up data and, and just hope that something happens. You should be aiming for something. And we should be able to measure the impact of opening up the data. So we try and uh, identify good stories that demonstrate how open data have led to social or environmental or economic benefits. So before I go any further, I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about what open data actually means, what open data is. Because people have quite a lot of misconceptions about what open data is. Um, 
So I start off with thinking about private data versus public data. Private data is data that you hold, data that you have internally within your organization. Public data is data that's out there that, that other people can get hold of. And of course, the way that you get from private data to public data is simply by publishing it. But that doesn't make it open. Just making data available does not make it open. In order to make data open for other people to actually use freely and without restriction, then you need to license that data. Licensing the data means adding an explicit license that says you are free to reuse this data however you like. You can republish it, you can uh, mash it up, you can do whatever you like with it. Um, and the only thing that you have to do is maybe uh, provide some attribution, say where you got it from, or perhaps you might have to republish any extra data that you create on top of the, the data that we've given you. So open data is accessible. People need to be able to get hold of it, preferably without going through any kind of registration forms or having secret uh, usernames and passwords. It needs to be machine readable so that people can process it, otherwise it's not data. Um, it, it needs to have then those licensing conditions associated with it that explicitly say that the data can be reused and that it can be republished. Another way of thinking about this is in the definition of freedom. Um, so you may be familiar with the distinction between gratis, free gratis, and free libra. Gratis means free as in beer. It means that you don't have to pay anything in order to do something, in order to get hold of some data. But there are often legal restrictions associated with free gratis uh, data. So examples are data that you scrape off the web. That's data that you can get for free, but there will usually be terms and conditions associated on each of the websites that you scrape that say you shall not scrape this website. So those restrictions, legally, you are doing something against those terms and conditions. Google Maps is another example. It's free to use Google Maps in order to look up postcodes or, or whatever, um, but there are legal restrictions about what you do with that data. If you go into the small print, you can see that you're, not allow you're only allowed to use it in those ways if you are actually using a Google Map, for example. And also stuff on WikiLeaks is another example of stuff that's free to access, but legally then there are some you, uh, dodgy restrictions about it, its use, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be on WikiLeaks. Libra, on the other hand, free as in speech, um, means that you are free to do what you want with the data that you access. So you seldom pay for free as in speech data, um, and that, but there are minimal restrictions. I mentioned the two restrictions that are possible for open data. Those are providing attribution. Uh, somebody who publishes can say you must attribute this data. Or they can also say that you must republish anything you create from that data as open data. Um, examples of this are open data, as I said. OpenStreetMap is another example. So you are free to... Uh, take OpenStreetMap data, do whatever you like with it, as long as you attribute it, and as long as if you create other data from it, you also republish that under the same license. Um, stuff on Wikipedia is another example of free, as in speech, information. You can take Wikipedia information and do what you like with it, because it's licensed in that way. So don't get confused between stuff that you can access without paying for it and stuff that you can access in order to reuse it and freely. Okay. And I want to just have an example, give you an example of why this is so important. Um, this guy is Ernest Marples. He's the guy that invented the postcode. And uh, several years ago, then an organization set themselves up, earnestmarples.com, in order to provide a postcode lookup service so that you could put in a postcode and it would tell you stuff about your administrative boundaries and so on. But they did that on top of data that they had um, accessed in a way that wasn't, uh, they, they did not have a license for that data. They did not have a license in order to um, provide the service that they were providing. Um, and that was kind of fine until lots of people started building on top of their API. And then Royal Mail, who did own the, the uh, intellectual property over that data, went to Ernest Marples and sued them, said, 
take this site down or we will come after you with our lawyers. And unsurprisingly, because they were poor little geeks, then they collapsed and said, OK, we're taking service offline. And all of those other services that had built their, their applications on top of this source of, uh, of data that was free to access but wasn't legally sound, they couldn't use it anymore. And so they, they couldn't use the kind of facilities that they wanted to anymore. So it's important to have data on a sound legal footing so that you know that you can build applications on top of it without risk, without data going away. That's why licensing is so important. Right, that's what open data is. Try to um, express the difference between uh, free data and open data there. Now I want to talk about how open data can be used for collaboration. So I've got three sets of examples um, around open data of collaboration. And this first example is collaboration around a problem. I want to give you a few examples of this and, and then draw out some lessons. So one example is prescribing analytics. Prescribing analytics is an application that was developed by Macedon C, Open Healthcare UK, and also uh, Ben Goldacre was involved uh, in developing it. And we helped to subsidize some of the work. Um, prescribing analytics looked at the way in which GPs prescribe a statins, a particular kind of drug, and whether they prescribed a version that uh, was uh, the generic version, which was very cheap, or a version that was a proprietary version, which is very expensive. Now, the, the proprietary version of the drugs come out of patent. You can get this cheap version, which is exactly the same, but um, People who go around selling drugs are sometimes more effective than, than others. And you can see up in the northeast there, um, where the really dark color is, what that means is that more GPs were using the proprietary version of the statin, prescribing the proprietary version, which is incredibly expensive, than the generic version, which is very cheap. Looking at the data across the UK, um, the analysis showed that you could save 200 million pounds a year on prescribing if you chose the generic drug over the, uh, over the proprietary drug. So that's taking data that was published openly by the NHS and performing some analysis on it in order to highlight a particular problem, which was statin prescription. Why open data is useful here is that you don't know what people are going to do with your open data. There's an asynchrony in the collaboration. You publish and other people use, or they publish and you use in whatever way. You don't have to set up a conversation in order to reuse it in the way that you want to. And you can take open data, add value to it, you can perform analysis over it, you can do visualization over it, you can create applications from it. Um, and the person who's publishing the data doesn't need to approve, doesn't need to give you permission, they don't, they don't need to give you a stamp or anything. Um, you can just go ahead and do it because it's open data. Often in these kinds of analysis, you think, well, why, why doesn't the person who owns the data, who's maintaining it, why don't they do these kinds of analysis themselves? Why hasn't the NHS done this kind of analysis and seen the amount of money that it could spend and then gone out and done something about it? Um, and the answers are, are, are quite simple, really. Um, skills are limited. Not everybody knows how to process data. Um, resources are limited. So not everybody knows how to process data, but those that do, well, they need to, uh, they need to concentrate their activities on the tasks that, they, that are more important to them. Everybody has to prioritize. Also, passion is limited. So the people who did this analysis, the prescribing analytics analysis, were convinced that there was some really bad prescribing practice going on, that GPs were prescribing these proprietary drugs rather than generic drugs, and they really shouldn't be doing that. It wasn't logical. Um, and so they were passionate about trying to show this. And they took the open data and they showed it. Um, and the other thing is that attention is limited. Now, this kind of analysis had been done around statins in the BMJ. It was, uh, it, there, there were plain old figures within uh, the BMJ from a, a several months before there were the, the visualizations that Mastodon C did. 
But in this world, then presentation is everything. If you can present something in a visual form, if you can present something in an interactive form, then you get a lot more attention on the actual problem. So having the skills to process data, having the resources to, pro to, to concentrate on something, um, having some passion around showing something from data, and being able to provide it in a form that is easy for people to grasp and pay attention to, um, these are the essential added value that you can give as a data reuser on top of the open data that people publish for you. The other thing that I've noticed around open data and around data use within organizations is that you can add value to open data simply by joining up sources of information that, that aren't joined up in other places. It's very easy to create data silos within an organization where you have your own data and you know how to process your own data. You're, you, you, you know what it contains and, and what it can do. Um, and you're maybe not aware of the other information, the whole slew of information that is out there that you could combine with it. You, maybe you can't access it because it's not open data. Or maybe you just don't trust it because it comes from somebody else. Now, open data can help a bit with this. By, o by opening up data, you can break down some of those silos because it means that you as a reuser can take data from multiple different places and mash it up in new ways that the people within individual organizations probably haven't thought of. But there are still some challenges here. How do you find open data and how do you know whether to trust it or not? I'll talk a little bit about those um, later on. The second kind of collaboration that I wanted to talk about is around aggregating multiple sources. So in the previous section, then I was talking about really having one source of, of data that you uh, could process in different ways, new and exciting ways, in order to create something that was, uh, was valuable. Now I want to talk about aggregating together data from multiple sources that is the same kind of data from those multiple sources in order to provide value and insight. First example I'm going to use is peer-to-peer -peer lending example, which is something that we've been involved in uh, fairly recently. So peer-to-peer -peer lenders are, are lend organizations that set up um, small transactions between individuals or between businesses where one individual lends directly to another individual or directly to a business, um, unlike big banks where it all goes into a kind of central pot. Um, so these peer-to-peer -peer lenders are, are a fairly new activity and the uh, Bank of England wanted to see what kind of activity was going on in peer-to-peer -peer lending. So three peer-to-peer -peer lenders provided their data in the same format, the same data, same format, and because they all provided it in the same format, the same kind of data, then it could be aggregated together to give us a picture of lending activity within the UK. Um, this showing, for example, that, the, that London and the South East dominate the lending within the UK to other places within the UK. Another example is government spending. Um, or departments are made to uh, publish data about what they spend money on on a routine basis every few months. Um, and because they all publish it in the same format, they all publish it the same kind of information, then that information can be aggregated together to give us this kind of picture which shows which, where the money is going, who, which organizations are benefiting from government spending. And you can see the big circle there is Capita. Um, that's mostly actually because it handles all the pension payments for teachers. Um, but you can get an impression about which companies are getting most money. So aggregation like this, the same data being published by multiple organizations, but then pulled together to give a global picture, um, is a really powerful way in which open data can be used. You can compare this overall analysis with the analysis within a particular organization, particularly if you contribute to it. You can compare the way in which you are operating with the way in which the market as a whole is operating, if you are all publishing open data of the same form. The other thing that I think is quite exciting is, is providing some kind of matched analysis. So what if I, um, as, an, as a 
say, as a GP prescribing uh, statins, what if I could see other GPs and the way their prescription behavior, maybe learn from them, see what, they, what, what interventions they have put into place in order to get better prescribing behavior, because I can see what they are doing. Um, so you can compare your own behavior to that of similar areas or companies or GP practices or whatever. Um, how do you motivate contribution to this kind of aggregate data? Well, one thing is that you can require it through policy or through regulation. So, for example, uh, the government spending data is all made available in the same format, etc., because there's a policy, a government policy, that says it must do so like that. Um, regulators, so people like Bank of England or FCA, could say everybody who I regulate needs to produce this data in this format as open data and so that we can use it and aggregate it. But you can also motivate it by just saying, well, if you provide your data, then you can get access to these kinds of comparisons, which um, you will find useful. If you are engaging in trying to set up one of these aggregations of data, what you need to make sure is that you ease the level, that you lower the barriers around contribution, um, and you lower the barriers around the, the difficulty of aggregating these data sources. So standardize on formats. Say what vocabularies you want people to use. Say what kinds of format of data you want people to publish in. And also, really helpful if you can provide some kind of validation tool, so that when people, uh, so that people can check that they're providing data in the right kinds of formats. So that's collaboration using aggregation. Now I want to talk about what I think is the most exciting kind of collaboration that you can do with open data, and that's collaborative maintenance of open data. So Safecast, has anybody here heard of Safecast? Safecast is a, an application where you can monitor radiation levels in your immediate vicinity. For example, get you one of their monitors and drive around in your car around, around, uh, around the country and monitor radiation levels. And then they aggregate it all together and give you a map. This is a map around the Fukushima um, nuclear plant in Japan, um, which shows not only the high radiation levels around the power plant, but also the plume that's extending to the southwest. So this is collaborative data that has been aggregated from multiple people providing data um, towards a single, uh, to, to a single source, which is then providing added value, providing this added insight. OpenStreetMap is another example of open collaboration. This is open data that anybody can, um, that can contribute to. You can go and edit the map that is provided by OpenStreetMap. You can add new shops on it or new paths that you discover. And for that reason, then, it's an extremely detailed map because people go and they, they do it just for fun um, or because they want to have a better map of their own area or because they know that it's, uh, if they provide a better map of their own area, then probably somebody else has provided a better map of their area too, and so everybody benefits. Another example which is very close to my heart, because this is what I did before I joined ODI, is legislation.gov.uk. Um, with legislation, you have uh, new legislation comes along and revises old legislation, and it's very hard to get an up-to-date view of what laws actually govern us, because you have to edit old legislation based on the changes that new legislation is making. Um, it's so hard, in fact, that uh, the revised legislation that is on our public database, Legislation Gov UK, is many years out of date. And trying to bring it up to date is a huge challenge for the small team that is supposed to be working on it. Um, so a new and radical way of dealing with this problem is the expert participation program, which is now used in order to manage Legislation Gov UK, um, where uh, businesses, academia, other government departments are all able to contribute to the, the maintenance of this legislation database. So by working together, more people can get better results. And um, in fact, there's a term for this, which is rather nice and complicated, called commons-based peer production. Lots of people Work, large numbers of people in a coordinated manner working together to, perform, to create large and meaningful projects. This definition, of course, comes from Wikipedia, which is an example of commons-based peer production. 
And this is one of the radical things that open data facilitates. Because people who uh, contribute to an open data source know that they can get their contributions back, and that makes them more willing to contribute to it. So to get into that kind of mode of working, how, how do you do it? Well, first of all, provide a means of incorporating feedback. It's astonishing how many people publish data, publish open data, but don't provide any mechanism for people to correct it. Um, I was talking to somebody just the other day who said, we got hold of this data, um, and we can see that there are some postcodes missing here. We know what those postcodes could be. We'd like to provide it back. Do you know how we should do that? And I said, no, because the, the organization that's published the data doesn't provide that kind of route back into contributing to the data, just simply to fix mistakes or to add value. Um, Crowdsource data, make it possible to do only a little bit of work, because lots of people doing only little bits of work adds up to something much, much bigger. But also build a bigger ecosystem. Make it possible to contribute a lot of work as well. Don't suppose that everybody is going to be contributing in the same way. With OpenStreetMap, obviously there, there's the possibility that you can edit in the, the editor online, um, but there are also uh, there are also ways to contribute by taking other data, processing it, and then having one huge, massive, big bulk upload into the, the database. And that's a, also a valuable way of providing information. So make it possible to provide information in lots of different ways and try to actively involve a larger community in managing a collaborative resource. Um, and just to reiterate the point, the motivation for anybody contributing to one of these uh, open data sets is that they can reuse the data themselves. There's more data, and it's more reusable because people are collaborating together in order to build it. OK, so I've talked about three different kinds of forms of collaboration. Asynchronous collaboration, which is empowered by open data because there's no, no need to go into any kind of one-to-one -one contract with people. I've talked about aggregate collaboration, where lots of organization publish in the same form, and that can be aggregated together. And I've also talked about collaboration, collaborative maintenance of open data assets. Um, what I'm going to do with the remaining time is just talk a little bit about the open data that Telefonica have opened up and the other da data resources that, that are available that might be useful in, in uh, mashing up with that Telefonica open data. Um, so Telefonica have recently opened up um, a small portion of the data from their Smart Steps uh, platform, which is basically monitoring footfall around London. The, the open data covers three weeks' worth of data from over the Christmas period, from 2012, uh, 2012 Christmas period. And you can see on an hourly basis within particular um, areas of London how many people uh, navigated through that area, how many of them were men, how many of them were women, what their kind of age range was, and that kind of thing. So we have some really good data there about... Um, people moving through the capital over those uh, three-week period. What kind of data could we use with that? Well, first thing is to look at demographic data. Um, Go to the Office of National Statistics. They have data coming out of their ears. Uh, in particular, the census provides a really core, um, good quality set of data about what people uh, reside in particular areas. Um, but there's also a wide range of surveys about, you know, internet use and um, uh, what kinds of jobs people do and so on. So you can use that data um, along with this geographical data about footfall to produce something new. Open Data Communities is another resource that I'd flag for demographic data. That is, uh, that's data from DCLG, the Department of Communities and Local Government, and it's local data that covers stuff about housing and homelessness, um, and also covers well-being and the indices of multiple deprivation, so you can see how rich and poor people are within particular areas. Geographic data comes from a variety of sources. You can get quite a lot now from uh, Ordnance Survey as open data. Ordnance Survey has opened up quite a, lot of uh, quite a lot of data over the past five years, including the postcode data that I talked about earlier from Ernest Marples. Um, 
The Office of National Statistics, again, provides statistical geographies. So if you're using the census, then you need to be using statistical geographies, which are designed to contain the same number of households in each little area. I'd also highly recommend looking at OpenStreetMap as a source of open data, particularly in London, because it's so well mapped. But you can use it to pull out information about features, about landmarks, like where are the, where are the uh, underground stations, where are the hospitals, where are the museums, where are the parks, Though, where are the Kentucky Fried Chicken outlets, right? You can get all of that kind of data from OpenStreetMap because um, just by processing the data that, that comes out of it. For transport data, you can go to TfL, but I warn you that their data is not open. You, you have to register and prove that you are going to do something worthy with it and uh, provide various details about what you're doing. Um, you can also go via Transport API, which is operated by one of the startups in ODI called Placer. Um, they provide a huge range of different kinds of transport information uh, on an ongoing basis as well as some, some historical information. I find that NAPTAN and MPTG are very useful. Those give uh, the locations of bus stops, tube stops, train stations, anywhere that you can think of uh, where, where transport nodes are and also connections between them. Another source of good transport data is traffic counts from the uh, Department for Transport, which is a huge, rich set, set of information where you, know, you have the counters by the side of the road that count how many cars and vans and cycles go past on a routine basis over the course of a day. I think that, combined with the Telefonica data about footfall, could be really valuable. The other data that you might want to be looking at is emergency services data. Data.police.uk is an incredibly rich source of information about crimes, um, which is aggregated every month and updated every month. Individual reported crimes, and you can see the outcomes of some of those crimes as well. Um, and they've published it in a very, very good way. Um, fire information, you can also get hold of individual records of fire, uh, 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 fire vehicles being deployed to particular locations, so you can see um, what kind of activity there was there. Ambulance information, we don't have so much of, but you can get a monthly summary at a, a local um, level from that URL there. But there's lots more open data available, and that's particularly from public government sources. You can go and look at the core catalogues at DataGov UK, and also if you're looking in London data, at Data London Gov UK, um, or just search, just Google for the data that you are interested in. I will warn you that lots of the data that you want won't be open. Always check the terms and conditions, look at the license, try and find out. And if it isn't open, start lobbying for it. If you need it, then start lobbying it for it to be open so that you can do stuff with it. Often people don't know, as publishers, that they can make data open very easily just by providing a license. They think that just publishing it is enough. But by providing a license, it gives you reassurance that you are able to use the data in the ways that you want to do it. So what can you do? I've got a few requests to you. First of all, give kudos to open data publishers. Because if you, if you thank them for the data that they've made available to you, it helps them to publish more. If you tell them how you are using your data, that helps them to build the business cases within their organizations that show that the data that they're publishing isn't just being ignored. Um, this is, it's easy when you, are, when you have people paying for your data to keep track of how many people are, are using it because you can tell how many people have paid for it. You can see that registration, those registrations. But when you provide open data, then you don't keep track of how many people use it. You have to be told. And so giving kudos, providing information back to open data publishers helps them to build business cases internally to open up more data and helps them to see that it's worthwhile also, give feedback to them. Tell them how to improve. Um, tell them both at the micro level, where there are errors in their data, but also at the larger level, how they could make data available to you in formats and forms that would make it more precious and more valuable and easier to use. 
And then my other big ask is publish open data yourself. If you are using open data from other sources, or if you are creating and maintaining data yourselves, then publish it as open data so that other people can build on it and use it. Of course, you need to make sure that you legally can publish the data as open data. You can't just take any old source that you find and then republish it under a license that you, you want to. Um, you have to be able to, to show that that's legal. legal. Um, then provide an explicit license, say what license it's available under, and there are a bunch of licenses, standard licenses that you can use, like the Creative Commons ones that we're all used to bunging on our slides. Um, and then maintain it. Don't just publish open data as a one-off kind of project, but if it's going to change, maintain it, keep it available. It's only by having maintained open data that other people can really build proper applications and products and services on top of what you're making available. We have a tool that helps run through the things to do when opening up data called uh, the Open Data Certificates, so certificates.theodi.org. And all it is is an interactive questionnaire that asks you about how you're opening up your data. It takes you through legal questions, some practical questions, some technical questions, and also some questions about how you're supporting it at a, at a social level, what documentation and uh, other support you're providing for the data. And then it gives you a badge as a reward for, for opening it up um, at various levels. So raw, just starting to publish open data through to the kind of expert level where we'd only really expect government to go um, for publishing really good routine da data. But over and above that badge, it also will provide you with a list of things that you could do in, in order to improve the way in which you're publishing data, in order to get more reuse out of it and to help it to be used by others. Um, and that's why we've, why we've developed it as a, as a service. Right. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Here. Thanks very much, Jenny. Um, in the example of the, the 10 startups you talked about that you deal with, um, I presume they're, of course, at the risk that the suppliers of the open data pull the plug or change the way it's published. So would those companies have agreements in place with the publishers to say, I don't know, for the next five years, don't change anything or make sure you maintain the data? So that's a, very, that's a really good question. Um, where, uh, and it's one of the reasons that we um, produce the open data certificate, because one of the things in, that you have to uh, say in order to get a certificate at the higher levels is that you guarantee to continue to supply the data over a period of time. It's those guarantees that really make the difference between an open data source that you can use for a one-off kind of project and for fun and for visualization, and an open data source that you can use to build a service and a company and a product over, over the top of. So yeah, the, those guarantees about continuing continued availability of open data are dead important. Um, in the, most of the cases for the startups that, that we're dealing with, uh, they are reliant on public data sources, so sources from government, and we kind of run the risk, as we, we do <laughs> in general with government, that they could turn around and, and change their minds at any time. But we also have a certain amount of trust that they won't, because open has been built into uh, so much of gov government policy now that that we don't think will happen. What I found with Legislation Gov UK, where there was a lot closer relationship with the, uh, with the users, the reusers of open data, um, because they were contributing back into the open data as well, was that, yes, if, if a company was going to invest that time, they would, create, they, they would ask for an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, uh, around the, the publication of data continuing over time, so that they knew that they were, they were building their business on a good thing and that, that their investment in, in, in uh, providing data back in was, was not going to um, be a waste. Um, of course, one of the things about open data is that it's all, uh, once you've got hold of it, you can you reuse it as many times as you want. It's the ongoing supply that is the, that is the issue. Um, and uh, what we would really like to see is that for very core uh, public sector data, um, such as lists of roads or um, 
this of hospitals, that kind of national information infrastructure, that it would actually be built into something very secure, like uh, you, that you would be able to see the contract that said it was going to be provided for the next 10 years as open data in this way because it's there's a contract that says so. Um, or even that was written into legislation that these identifiers would be available, that there would be this data available for the public to use. Okay. Uh, as a follow-up to that question, Jenny, uh, there are different types of organizations that are opening data. So I would like you to, if you can, talk about the diversity of different organizations that are opening data. And then also, in order for them to provide quality data over time, have you seen any models through which they're trying to make that sustainable via monetizing somehow the data, even though it's open, but how can they cover their costs right. uh, through some level of that? OK, yeah. Um, so, so one of the things that I find really exciting about working at ODI is that we're not just focused on government data. It's not just the public sources of, of open data that, that we look at. And what we see is a growing interest from the private sector in opening up data so that they can benefit from it. And we're starting to see those businesses investigate what those business models might be. So one business, for example, that, that I know of, um, is interested in opening up their data because they want to uh, pr provoke innovation amongst developers with the express purpose that once new uh, important services and products have been developed by that outside world based on their data, they can then buy those companies and incorporate them into their own business and therefore have a better kind of model. So I call this outsourcing R&D, right? It, it's, it's getting other people to do your R&D for you rather than investigate, investing in it yourself, de uh, reducing your risk for all of that investment, but then being able to reap the benefits of it. Other organizations, when they're opening up data, particularly data, um, providers who are used to charging for data, tend to take a, um, a freemium kind of model. So they will have some data that they open up um, as, as open data uh, at a low granularity or maybe out of date a bit or maybe only at a maybe at an aggregate level, maybe under a, a particular license that limits what, what kind of organization is likely to want to use it. So using a share alike license, for example, as we find with, with software, um, you can dual license uh, a piece of software under a share alike license, which means that anybody who builds on top of that software has to release their own software as, um, as open source as well, or you can license it under a commercial agreement, which means it, that the organization can keep it in-house. You can do that same thing with, with data. So you can license it under a share-alike agreement so that anybody who uses that data has to then republish that data or, or and then offer a paid-for license agreement where um, where organizations that don't want to that want to keep their data to themselves then they can uh, th enter into that more financial um, uh, arrangement um, the other one I mean for, for legislation gov UK the business model there is about maintaining a resource that they want to use in-house. The government currently spends seven million pounds a year buying back data from private sector organizations that, that maintain legislation databases. If it had its own source of data that could be open data, then it would save that money, right? As well as being able to provide a better service for the public. Now, there are, there are cases where organizations are, are maintaining their own data for their own purposes, where they get benefit out of that data themselves. And in those cases, then entering into a model where you collaborate with other people to maintain that data but make it open actually can give you benefits. Um, the key for me is to stop seeing data as a resource that you sell and start seeing data as a, as, as a key um, as a key resource that you use within your organization and that you deploy in order to get to selling the things that you actually want to sell better. Um, 
Another example there is, is you know, if you're, uh, which, which people sometimes use is, um, if you're running a restaurant, you don't want to give away the food for free, but by heck, you want to give away the menu for free because then people know what you've got on, right? So it, there are different types of data that you have within your organization. Some of it might be just so precious that you do not want to um, make it open, that you just want to use it internally. But there's other data that you may want to make available in order to drive people to your business because if they have better information about your business, then, then you will get their custom better. Okay. We had some more questions. Anybody else here? Hi. Hi. I have a quick question. Do you cooperate with the United Nations also? Because they have uh, UNPAN, which is United Nations uh, Public Administration Network. So I'm just wondering if you are a part of it or... Thank you. No, we, we haven't got any official relationship with the UN at the moment. Okay. But uh, interested to hear more about it. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Hi. So I, I always ask the same question. <laughs> what about formats and standards uh, for publishing open data? What's, uh, is there any mainstream in the adoption of some format? Right. Um, so m my routine answer would be <laughs> that um, there are different kinds of data that you might want to publish, and uh, different kinds of data require different kinds of formats. Um, for for legislation data, for example, it's very document driven, it's very word heavy and it needs uh, lots of kind of inline markup. And so for that reason, then we used XML for it as the format. Um, in lots of data that is published, it comes of a, in a kind of tabular form. And so publishing as CSV is the standard that we would generally ask people to use, although it's a very poor standard and one that we're hoping to, to um, find ways of improving. Um, if you are publishing an API, then most developers, if you want to get into reuse of that data, most developers would prefer you to provide a JSON version of that data. Um, if you are uh, publishing data that, you, that is very diverse and that you want to be mashed up with lots of other diverse sources, then publishing in RDF is a reasonable thing to do. And we would always also recommend uh, publishing data with URLs in it, no matter what format you are publishing data in. We find that identifiers for things that are URLs are incredibly powerful for matching up diverse data sets um, and also for providing access to extra information about the things that are talked about within data. Okay. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes for one more question. But if not, I'd like to thank Jenny very much for thank your you. presentation, for your answers. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Our next session starts here in just about 10 minutes, which will be delivered by John Britton from GitHub. Thank you.